I am Jim Steinbacher. I'm the technical evangelist for Wi-Fi at WatchGuard Technologies. As a technical evangelist, hallelujah. Let me hear hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wi-Fi hacking is all around us. Here's the reality that each and every one of us face every day. If you've ever connected to public Wi-Fi without a VPN connection, I can virtually guarantee you've been hacked. Now we're all IT folks here. We all have security somewhere in our head. How can this possibly be true? And if it was true, why haven't we heard about it in the big wide world? If you're one of the few that has escaped, you're lucky. But you won't be lucky for long. Because the hackers are out there. And they're out to get your data. They're out to get your company's data. And any kinds of financial resources that you might have at your disposal, they'd love to get their hands on that as well. You shouldn't be shocked. Wi-Fi hacking today is commoditized. Now, what, what possibly could I mean by that? Well, if you go out to YouTube and you search on Wi-Fi hacking, you'll find more than 3.3 million videos on how to ha hack Wi-Fi. Some of you probably have gone out and looked at them. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really simple. The frightening aspect of it is Wi-Fi is incredibly easy to hack. There are dedicated hacking tools that are available. One of the most common is the Wi-Fi pineapple. $99. You get a dual radio module capable of running on a battery capable of downloading a variety of different types of attacks. It can run, you'll never know that it's been run. And that's the insidious thing about Wi-Fi hacking. You don't know that you've been hacked. Kali Linux. It's free. It's optimized as a penetration testing tool. It's free. Download it. You got a spare laptop at home? Oh, you're there. And all the tools that you can download, they really can be used for penetration testing, but they can also be used for more nefarious acts. And there's new tools that are coming out every day. So this isn't a threat that's suddenly going to go away. It's going to be rearing its ugly head more and more often. How is that possible? Well, because hacking Wi-Fi is pretty easy. And also today's smartphones help the hacker right along. They truly add to the problem. Most users. You, me, IT professionals really don't understand how Wi-Fi works. We all use it. We all can configure it. But that doesn't necessarily mean we understand how it works. And if we don't understand how it works, it's even harder for us to figure out why it fails. So Matt's discussion about uh, AI in the world of troubleshooting. That's really valuable to the novice professional as well as the experienced one because we can infer a lot more information from that. But understanding truly the basics of Wi-Fi is critical. And here's a challenge I would give to each and every one of you. If you think you understand Wi-Fi and how it works, explain it to your spouse. If you can do that, if you can put it into terms that your spouse will understand, or your children, then you understand Wi-Fi. 
If what you're doing is relying on the data sheets and speeds and feeds and that discussion, there's probably a little more thinking along the concepts behind how Wi-Fi works that you might take some time to investigate. Here's perhaps the most dangerous aspect of all. Thoughts about wireless security seem to end at WPA2. Oh no, okay, there was a problem with WPA2, now we're going to be saved by WPA3. Well, a couple of things, just a note about that. WPA3 is primarily a hardware-based security aspect. That means that every client has to change. Every access point has to change. And is that going to happen tomorrow? Odds aren't very good. Fortunately, the exploit, the crack exploit, which was used as part of the breaking the handshake for WPA2, most of the devices that are out there, access points, certainly in the enterprise space, have been patched for that. But not all. And if you're running an access point in your business that hasn't been, you've opened yourself up potentially to a hacker coming in there. The guys that actually did that research have recently published a new paper and found a second exploit for WPA2. It's a little harder than the first one, and the first one wasn't easy. A little harder, but it's there. So none of these standards are, are foolproof. We all know that. Locks can be picked. But that's not what security is about. Client devices, your phone, your laptop, send out beacon requests all the time. And what do those beacon requests say? They're looking for known networks, networks that you've already connected to. Home network, are you here? Work network, are you here? If a known network is found by your device, it'll just connect to it. You don't have to do anything. If you have that saved, if you've connected to it before, conveniently, your smartphone helps you out and connects to it. And this is the default behavior. So maybe we are in, his, in this room, security conscious, and maybe we turn off our Wi-Fi whenever we're not attached to a known secure place, but I'll bet not. But even if we did, even if every person in this room did, how many people do you know that aren't even technically literate enough to understand the threats? Everybody, right? My mother's 86 years old. She wouldn't understand this. She has enough problems just getting her iPhone to work. And that's pretty simple. Here's what I mean. Here are the iPhone settings for Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi's turned on. There's a switch here that says, ask to join networks. Does that mean if I turn that switch off, I won't automatically join networks? No. What it means is, that if I happen to come across a new network, I'll ask if you want to join it. The little fine print here that's so easy to overlook, known networks will be joined automatically. If no known networks are available, you'll be asked before joining a new network. Thank you, Apple. Oh, I guess it's true for Android, too. Wi-Fi will turn back on if you're near a safe network like your home network, or like Starbucks, or like the hacker that lives next door. What a convenient feature that is. I thought I had my Wi-Fi off, I thought I was secure, but oh, my phone has overridden my desires. Connect to open networks. Automatically connect to high quality public networks. <coughs> oh great, now I'm out wandering down the street. 
my phone happens to come across one of the public networks, let's see, Telstra Air, I'll just automatically connect to that. Great. Do an open network notification when an automatic connection isn't available. All right, so th these are the smart devices. And if you don't believe me that they're constantly looking, take a look at your laptop and watch it say, searching for a new network, or your phone, searching for new networks. So what's going on when it's searching for new networks? I'm already connected. What it's doing is it's sending out a beacon request. And in that beacon request has a copy of an SSID that it's familiar with. And so there it is. Everyone's phone that's in here is sending out beacon requests right now if you've got your Wi-Fi turned on. The attack, the most common attack for Wi-Fi is a man-in-the-middle attack, and it's been around since almost the beginning of Wi-Fi. Basically, it's really simple. I have a client here, I've got a hotspot here, and the golden grail of the wild, world wide web over there. The hacker convinces your phone it should attach to him and he's in the middle between you and the Wi-Fi and the internet. The most common attack. Here's, here's one of the attacks that uses man in the middle. It's called the karma attack. So, it's child's play. This is really, really easy. Hacker uses the device, like the Wi-Fi pineapple. It listens to those beacon requests your phones or laptops are sending out. It captures those SSIDs in a pool. Your client, your phone, auto-joins the network that is being broadcast with that SSID that it picked up. Are you my preferred network? Yes, you are. I'm going to connect. Example two, the evil twin. So, this guy's a hacker. You can tell because he's wearing a hoodie. <laughs> hacker is sitting outside your business in their car. And they're using a device like a pineapple. Maybe they've used the external antenna connections that they've put on a directional antenna. They listen, they find out the SSID that you're broadcasting, they turn around and they broadcast that back toward your building with open authentication. The hacker then looks in, sees you've got folks attached to the access point in your network, he sends DOF packets, which causes those clients to disconnect. But his access point has a higher gain antenna and a stronger effective signal than the access point that you have in your building. So what do those clients do? They help you out, I'm gonna search for the next highest signal, oh, there it is. And they attach via open authentication to the hacker sitting out there in the car because they auto-join. It doesn't ask you at work, do you want to rejoin the network? It just does it for you. Hackers use these techniques all the time. Why? Because they work. How many of you in here were aware that these techniques exist for hacking? How many of you have taken all the precautions you need to prevent it from hacking? <laughs> so, there's my office, now I've got none connected in my office, and they're out here. Now let's talk a little bit more about security. How many offices do you know, regular businesses, that use a simple pre-shared key as the security measure? You might as well take a little sticky note 
and stick it on your monitor and say, here's the password. Because as soon as you use that technique to secure your Wi-Fi, especially in a business, what happens? The word gets out. Friends tell friends who tell other friends. And you don't have security in your office anymore. <coughs> and let's remember which side of the firewall are access points. I think they're inside the perimeter already. So all of those uh, firewall rules that you set up to prevent things coming in from the outside, well, they're already there. They don't have to worry about it. Here's the third thing. These attacks really happen. Less than a year ago, Headline, Starbucks, Argentina, December of last year. Guests come into the, to the Starbucks, and they're presented with the very common splash page on the captive portal. Oh, well, it must be safe because it's a captive portal. User clicks on accept. Now, what happens? Well, there's actually, this is a false captive portal. The, the hacker is putting this up, probably using one of the convenient modules that's available on this pineapple. When you click on accept and connect, what are you actually doing? You think you're accepting terms and conditions to jump onto the network. What you're actually doing is giving him permission to do a browser injection of about 10 lines of JavaScript that while you're connected to Starbucks, Wi-Fi is going to mine Bitcoin. Mining away. Now, you might not think that's, you, you think, oh, I could, I could figure that out. But let's remember what everyone's experience with public Wi-Fi is. It sucks, right? It's slow, it's choppy, you get bumped off all the time. So these victims that were sitting in Starbucks, their laptops were running really, really slow. Did they think, huh, my CPU might be running at 100% and it might be doing something I don't want it to do? No, they blamed it on the Wi-Fi. So what we've done is we've created an unsafe, free access environment. Now you might ask, why haven't we heard about these breaches everywhere? Well, you're hearing about one now. And, but the real reason is, it doesn't happen to all of us as a group, as one homogeneous entity here. It happens to us individually. And as a result, we don't always notice. So when I say that everybody in here has been hacked, you have been. It might not have been malicious but you have been hacked. By the man in the middle on your way to the internet. You may have already been hacked. Don't believe me? Well, I just so happen to have been running a Wi-Fi pineapple all the time you guys have been here. Is it plugged into anything? No. Is it running on this bad, big ass battery? Yeah, this battery, it can run 24 hours on this battery. What's it been doing? Listening. <coughs> doing a karma attack. It's actually doing two things. It's listening, it's rebroadcasting your SSIDs and you're connecting up. And it's providing a hotspot. Look at your phones, just for right now. See if you happen to be hooked up to Qantas free Wi-Fi. If you have, you are a victim. Right? That's how easy it is. That's how it works. So let me plug you in here. And let's see, without too much embarrassment, who all the victims are. So I'm going to disconnect that. I'm going to 
connect them over here. Grab my laptop here. And I'm going to show you. That's not the scary part, guys. Right? So, so I can talk about this all I want. And you can talk to your boss your environment, you know, whoever it is that you need to talk to about this to make sure, okay, so far so good, we're getting there. sitting up here and it's been working so let's see this is the bad part about getting old guys just don't get old having to wear cheaters <sighs> let's go to the dashboard see where we are well, lo and behold I have 10 clients currently connected here <laughs> I have collected 325 SSIDs in the short time that we've been here and you know why I only have 10 clients on here because I limited it to 10. <laughs> because this poor little CPU is just chugging away. I'm trying to process the data. So the only thing I'm running is basically the karma attack. But let's see who's all connected there. Anybody recognize their phone? Roy's Apple Watch is connected. <laughs> yeah. Henry's connected. Or I won't read. Somebody's Galaxy Note 8. Aaron's connected. Jim's connected on here, but I always connect myself just in case the demo goes south. I can say, yeah, see, even I connected here. That's that's my insurance policy. So let's go back to the dashboard and now let's look at some of these SSIDs that I've carried. They're all over here. I'll start going through the list. I won't make you raise your hand like I do most of the time. Because by the time I get down to the end of this list, everyone in here will have had an SSID show up here that they've connected to any time in their life. So, you know, all hands free Wi-Fi. If you use the Wi-Fi here, I collected the SSID, and so now what I'm doing part-time on this guy, instead of broadcasting whenever I do uh, the Qantas, if I turn it into a true karma attack, it would be broadcasting all hands. There's Qantas, but it's up there too. Power Local, free Wi-Fi, about Westfield. Vic Instant, Tapes Test, Test 2, Aruba training, that's convenient. <laughs> Alpha, WPA2, uh, Macquarie Guest, there's a HP printer, that's always nice to have. You need to update the use the one, you got it wrong. So, Ghost, Open Test, how many more are we on? 325 of these guys. Apple Setup, Mo Guest. Telstra, somebody's home router there, you know, Air NZ Wi-Fi, Moto G, Lightspeed, Blizzard, Aloft Guest, somebody stayed in a loft recently and connected to their Wi-Fi. 
Lomeridian, somebody stated a Lomeridian. I know it wasn't me. You know, corpse wheat number one. Eagle service zero one. Staff at Sheridan. You know, Dexas, Dexas customer. I go on and on and on. Not nice snoopies here. <laughs> on and on. Sheridan guest, Ruckus management, Oswald test, Mercure, Silverado Seiko, Netgear, Accord. On and on and on and on. And if this was a more powerful device, if it had more memory. I actually have an SD card in here. So there's an attack called SSL split. Here's what SSL split does. It's not, uh, you're not quite as vulnerable today as you were a year ago to SSL split because most financial institutions are running pure HTTPS on all of their web pages, so all are secure. But what SSL split basically does is you think you're connecting to your bank, https.jimsbank.com. It goes out to the web. But what happens is these pages typically would fall back to HTTP if they fail with HTTPS. And so the hacker, the man in the middle, turns around broadcast back to your browser the HTTP web page. You still think you are secure because you typed in HTTPS, but he's blocked that and instead has returned HTTP. Now you enter in clear text all your banking information or your email information or the critical information you got that you don't want anybody else to see. You enter that and he captures it. Does he do anything with it right then and there? No, that would be way too obvious. He just sits and lets it sit on the couch over there, lets it run, logs all the data. Everything is right with the world. Chugs along, <coughs> collects the data, goes home. He doesn't have to sip a latte now. Now he can sip his nice wine because he's at home and he's got your information, and now it's time to start the real work. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to start brute forcing passwords. Oh, this is a username and password. Oh, the password's hashed. How many of you, and yes, you have to raise your hand, have at least one login today that has eight characters or less on it? Come on. You know you do, somewhere. Maybe it's not on something secure, but you've got it. How about nine? Nine characters. 10? How many have common phrases like, Jim's birthday is 10 5 XX? You probably don't have that one. We have, there are lots and lots of common phrases out there that are also used for passwords. So we think link is the only thing we need, but it's not. Yes, length is harder to brute force, but not if you're silly. You know, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog might be a really long password, but I bet there are people out there that are using that thinking they're safe, and they're not, because all I have to do is do a dictionary attack. Who knows what a dictionary attack is? Your security people, you need to know what a dictionary attack is. It's pretty simple. It got its name from, okay, I want to crack passwords. How do I do that? Do I brute force it? Do I calculate everything all the time? No, I, I can't really do that. Long passwords take a long time. But people need simple mnemonics to remember things. So they use, the hackers said, I'll bet they're using words that were in the dictionary. And if I type in every word in the dictionary and it gets hashed, I now have a table. Here's the hashed password. Here's the clear text password. And so now I can build, now I've collected all of the passwords and I can start, do I have to calculate what they are? No, I just start doing pattern matching. Let me pull up a slide here. 
This was from presentation updated. All right, it's not pulling up. Basically, I went out to the net and typed in dictionary lists and hit enter. And what I got was about 450,000 pages with links to pre-compiled dictionary lists. Not just the words that were in the dictionary, phrases, birthdays, combinations of names and birthdays. So now I have a dictionary with hashed passwords that basically has about 15 million entries in it. I just doubled that because I went and grabbed the, uh, uh, was it, the, the Facebook breach and added those. Now, I've got this huge database. I've collected your data because your smartphone has helped me. I'm processing it on my own time, and you're at risk. We're all at risk. Wi-Fi Pineapple can do all kinds of cool things. Cool is relative, I know. Uh, it's easy to set up. It takes about five minutes. I'm actually, this is, you. If you're connected here, you have Wi-Fi. Why? Because I told it to connect to the free Wi-Fi here. So it hasn't cost me anything. But suppose I don't want to do that. Suppose what I want instead is just to use my mobile hotspot. I turn the power down on this. I just get a few people. I still have internet access. All the data is going through my phone. They think they're connected to the net. I'm happy as a client. They're connecting, collecting data all day long. Let's see here. So, oh, I got a new, got a fresh one in my pool here. <laughs> you know? um, so, I can't stress to you enough that we have to take responsibility for security for ourselves and our network. My last slide's not going to come up because I've got to turn the laptop back on. It's too big a hassle. But I'll tell you what it, what it is in conclusion. We are all networking professionals, IT professionals. We have a social responsibility to help those that fundamentally can't help themselves. We are the knowledge keepers, and we owe it to ourselves and to all of those people that rely on us for our security expertise to understand the risks of Wi-Fi, know that there are ways to mitigate those risks, and help teach all those people that are responsible or that you care about. Family, workers, employers. Because if you don't, the millions of record breaches will mean nothing. All the notoriety in the world will mean nothing if we can't stop it. So understand how to stop it, understand how Wi-Fi works, understand what the threats are, how to fix it. Take that upon yourself, it's a challenge. And there are companies out there that can help. So, that's all I have. Thank you. I don't know what I ran over, but we're good. Are you scared? Are you worried about your Wi-Fi security now? You should be. Seriously. <laughs> Jim, Jim, Jim. Thank you, Jim. All hands free Wi-Fi. Yeah. I don't know if I want to be friends with you, Jim. <laughs> okay, now uh, we we got some uh, we got some time, guys. So this is going to be good. So while we got Jim up, any any questions? Any questions for Jim? We can take some questions. You can save it for the panel or uh, ask. Yeah. Him. At the start, we're talking about a Wi-Fi problem. 
at the start, you were talking about a Wi-Fi problem. And you said it's because there was only one AP down here. Was it because of that or because it was pineapple? Oh, at the very beginning? Yeah. No, it's because there's only one AP down here. Oh. Okay. But in those environments, so as it happened, I didn't go in and change the channel. It was running on channel six. So we actually had both APs down here running on channel six. But um, if I really am smart, and that's only because this device, this cheapo device, uh, the $100 one, is only uh, 802.11G, right? It's not, doesn't have a five gig radio in it. It's slightly bigger brother. This is called the Nano. The Tetra, the next one up, it's about thirty dollars more. It's dual, bam. So it's, but it's physically bigger as well. But lots more memory, lots more CPU. It can chug away for hours. So if you're in an environment where you need to have multiple APs, you can actually. What's to say you can't deploy multiple collecting devices? You can, as long as you provide it with an internet source, it's happy to go. Um, so you, you showed us how you know people can actually get hacked in by yep. you know for instance just hacks on that Wi-Fi. I mean you're from WatchGuard, so do you have any best practices or recommendations on um, how we can protect our clients from from that type of attack? By for instance, perhaps you know, put a WatchGuard firewall between the Wi-Fi network. And then like, well, well, no, actually, the actually WatchGuard firewall won't help you here. Okay. Right. WatchGuard does sell firewalls. That's the most of our business. The reason I'm up here talking about Wi-Fi because we also have Wi-Fi products. Um, and we're a security company, and security is important to us. And that's why we, we actually have products that are specifically oriented. Typically, you're going to use a technology called WIPs, Wireless Intrusion Protection System. There's some drawbacks to many different implementations of WIPs. Because how many of your clients or your coworkers don't want to take the time to go through the logs and say, oh, this is a good AP, this is a bad AP, this is a good client, this is a bad client, every day as they hit more and more people on the network. You've got to have a system that's automated, that can say with absolute certainty, this is a rogue AP. And what do I actually mean by a rogue AP? It could be this pineapple. It could be somebody brought their Linksys router from home and plugged it into the network. Why? Because the Wi-Fi you've been providing doesn't work very well and they want better signal right there at their desk. So they breached your network on the wired side through the wireless. But somebody else could connect to it. It's pretty easy to do, right? Um, maybe they're using their mobile hotspot as a way to get around your security on your network. What do they do then if it's tethered, it's going through their laptop, it's connected through to the wired network? Now you've just bridged whatever it is unsecure out here through to your network. You gotta be able to stop that. You gotta be able to stop threats like ad hoc file sharing. No, I got airdrop here. My trade secrets, all my trade secrets are on here. I decided to share it with Keith here because I know I can trust it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I need to be able to stop those behaviors as well. It's not, the best practice is understanding your environment and understanding the risk. And if you don't know yourself, talk to the people that do. Right? Don't be afraid to do that. Because we really, true, all of us need to create trusted wireless environments. We need to know that when we go into Starbucks, and we're connecting to, and I use Starbucks all the time, by the way, because in the US alone, Starbucks has 13,000 locations. We need to know that when we go in there and the SSID says Starbucks and we connect to it, that it actually is Starbucks. And by the way, WPA3 doesn't help you do that. So if I've connected to a rogue AP, I've connected very securely to that rogue AP. So we gotta be careful of that. So the, the fundamental best practice is understand your phone. Go start looking at some of those 3.3 million YouTube videos. Pick yourself up one of these guys. Nothing I've done here, by the way, is illegal in any way. 
the end, I can broadcast anyone's SSID. It's only when I'm trying to do something bad with it that it becomes problematic and a reflection of the law. So one of the other things to know about WIFs is you've got to be selective too. You have to understand not just your network, you got to understand what's around you. Because if you can't for certain identify this is a neighbor AP, if you have to do that, because you can't disrupt anybody on their network. It's against the law, at least in the states. Um, and that's because of our friends at So there was a case in the US where, about five years ago, where Marriott Hotels wanted you to buy their wireless. And so what did they do? They turned on their hotel Wi-Fi product with WIPs, and it and basically said, disconnect anyone using a mobile hotspot because I want them to buy it from me. They were sued. It went to the Federal Communications Commission, who in turn said, eh, 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 you can't do that. And so today, if you look at most vendors' whips, there's a warning that basically says, don't do this. Don't turn this on, because if you do, you might really get in trouble. But then use it as a last resort. Not all vendors do that, but some do. Check if yours does. Other questions? Uh, Whoops and Woods are relatively uh, retrospective. Are there any standards in Wi-Fi or upcoming standards that might help you mitigate these problems? Karma attacks? Um, if you're building a wireless network and you need to authenticate, use WPA2 Enterprise. Basically, WPA2 Enterprise, you've got uh, a radius server that's going to back into LDAP or AD and authenticate your folks that way. By the way, the, the crack vulnerability at WAP2 did not apply to WPA2 Enterprise. So that's the first thing I would do. Two-factor authentication, right? That's, that's really a, a benefit. If you can use two-factor, now you know that not only is the password secure and the device secure, I'm authenticating correctly against the uh, target, because that uh, two-factor works both ways. You can't fool it by saying, oh, connect with me, I'm your authenticator. I'll fool you. You can't spoof that piece. Um, two-factor, maybe even add biometrics to that and make it free. Those are the things that I would do, start doing today. Don't have open authentication on anything. That's misconfigured, is it, if, if you do that. Um, let's see, what else? There are, there's an increasing number of, of recommendations that are occurring online that you could go and find. I, don't, I mean, I can say, yeah, I got our website. There's lots of stuff there. But I promise I would be vendor neutral. Check out your vendor's website, because there are practices about how to set these things up. Um, if you do have an opportunity, to run WIPs, I would highly recommend you turn it on. Find out what the management overhead is going to be, but that's absolutely the best way to do it. I don't know, Keith, do you have? A lot of people are very ignorant to this security. Yeah, a lot of people are ignorant to this, yep. When I try to sell somebody a wireless network, or I do, when we set it up, I do always try and set up enterprise. They don't want to know about it. They just want a nice, simple password. Right. Doesn't matter. I've got a pineapple. I've showed people this. Is this still Why does this apply to me? When you show them that demo and they see their home SSID on there and they ask you, how did you get that? You gave it to me. Just have so that's, that's exactly right. You just have to sniff, right? Um, I think if, if what you were trying to sell is a performance network, hey, who are you talking to? You're talking to the other IT guys, right? Because we sell speeds and feeds. 
Sometimes we actually even sell benefits. My sense is, if you're selling security, you're talking to the wrong guy if you're talking to the IT guy. They might appreciate the technical side of things, but it's the financial guy who is so risk adverse that if you say, these are the holes that Wi-Fi has, the first reaction is, turn the damn thing off. But we can't do that today. We've got to have Wi-Fi. I know lots and lots of businesses that are 100% wireless. So we've got to find the ways to get around that. So you talk to the CFO and you say, this is what the risks are. We can fix this. And the CFO will say, all right, do it. What I'll probably do next is talk to the internal IT guy, if it's the CIO or the IT manager. So you can make that easier for them. You can provide them with a list of, yeah, here's, here's a bunch of resources. Go look at this stuff independently and figure out whether it works, whether they're telling the truth. And they'll come back to you and say, yeah, what he's saying is right. We need to buy this. And by the way, the CFO is the guy that writes the check. So if you sell him, it doesn't matter about the IT manager. The only thing you got to do is be careful, right? If I'm going in, if I go in tomorrow to try and sell with a partner against someone who had sold them Wi-Fi last year and it wasn't mine, and I tell them about all these security flaws, well, I just put the IT guy's job in jeopardy. He don't need to come in and talk to him. So instead, you just frame it that I become aware that this security threat exists, and you all have it today. Who knew about all these things before? Who, who actually had an experience on a first-hand basis that you know of? Remember, we're the IT guys. If we haven't done it, we can't expect the users to, so we've got to find a way to convince them to take the steps necessary to apply security. It's more important than coverage. It's more important than troubleshooting because it's tied directly into the knowledge base of your company, of your personal information. Can I answer your question? Okay, we've got, we've got another question here. Where was it? One of your key message in your presentation was, you know, we need to, you know, this is all the risk. For example, you just almost created the evil twin you know, yeah. the current attack. Well, where is the balance between user experience, security? Because, for example, one of my customers, you know, having an open network and a technical world was one of the business use cases, you know, the main driver of the Wi Fi. Right. So, where is the point? And some, some of them are hi hybrid, but you can have a secure corporate one and then a front face, client face, sure. Wi Fi. So the, the Wi Fi measures, or at least for the marketing team, or some, some of them collect data, which is important. Where is the balance? So where you can find the balance in, in that component, having security, but also uh, enhancing or providing the user experience at the customer point? Okay, let me, let me frame it to you. And that's a great question. Where is the balance between? ease of authentication, data collection for analytics and everything else. Where's the balance between that and security? Let me ask you this. If it was your child who was connecting to the open portal, the captive portal, how much risk are you willing to accept for them? Zero. So the truth is we can't have any tolerance now, is that realistic? No, of course it's not. But we've got to move toward that, guys. We actually do. And if it compromises some of the other features that we're using, why do you buy insurance? Well, it's been 30 years since I've been in a car wreck. Why the hell am I still paying for insurance? It's sometimes not for me. It's for the other joker that's going to come in and hit me. You know, that's why we buy insurance. Um, and yeah, it's, this is a tough sell. I, don't don't let me sell it short. I know exactly how difficult it is to sell this to someone. Um, but that's why we, as professionals, in our professional opinion, if we truly believe it, we need to find the words to sell it to those decision makers. We owe it to them. We owe it to ourselves. I know, I sound like a preacher, like some, some evangelist. 
Okay, I think we've got time for one more question and then we'll break for lunch. One more question? Work once. Join twice. You're free! No, no, no. you're not. It's all about the infrastructure side. It's more of a client problem, isn't it? If you can force mutual authentication, TLS, um, so the client's not accepting that open connection by the pineapple, is that the way to, to go and enforce your corporate protocols? Um, you could try and switch those things off on the phone and say automatically connect to open networks to don't. I don't know how you do it on an iPhone, but on a PC you could force the, the protocol. Yeah, you can, you can do it on an iPhone as well to a degree. And on an Android phone to a degree. I think that the um, it is a client issue uh, as much as it is a, a provider issue. Um, but it's it's harder to do it to, yeah, don't worry, what, 100 million access points out there? How many users on there? You know, 10, 20, 30 fold number of users than that? That's where the challenge is, getting the word out to the masses. If you guys, as security people, haven't heard the message, how are we gonna get those clients to do it? The only thing we can do, we can pressure the vendors, right, the phone companies that you buy your phones through, pressure them to go ahead and, and apply default settings that keep people safe. Microsoft tried to do some of that. That's probably the start. Um, and just be aware of the threats. That's, I mean, that's truly all I can say. That educating clients, good luck. Good luck. Thanks, Jim. You bet. It's great, man.